Well, back onto the dangerous and winding road that we've been walking the last couple weeks, and that is the treacherous 17-mile stretch from low Jericho to the heights of Jerusalem. There it is there. There's an aerial view for you to see. That is the road um, where the Good Samaritan story takes place. And that story has revealed all sorts of incredible things. It's on that road where brokenness is revealed in a whole new way and we see beauty where ugliness is transformed into glory, where loving kindness counters cruelty and where mercy meets deep need. Now we've been exploring the contours of the story of the Good Samaritan now for a few weeks because we've been learning to see what it means to love our neighbor as ourself. What does that look like in our lives. And today we're going to continue that journey, uh, but today we're going to do it a little bit differently. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the parable of the Good Samaritan. We're going to talk about that, but we're going to set that alongside another story of deep mercy and deep compassion. So today, two stories, two stories, one crucial point. So last week we talked about some of the barriers to neighboring, right, to loving our neighbor as ourself. And one of those barriers is fear in all of its various forms. Well, this week, the barrier that we're going to be talking about is hurry. Hurry is an enemy of loving our neighbor. All right, so two stories, one crucial point, and that is this, that hurry is an enemy of loving our neighbor, and we have to diagnose this, and we need to deal with it. So first, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Let's take our time to inhabit the world of the story and again see what Jesus has been teaching us, and then we'll move on to another story, which is... Um, Incredible. And by the way, it's, it's a wonderful thing to, to let the Scripture interpret the Scripture and to hold one story uh, from the Bible next to another story, right? And bring these things together because all sorts of new light is shed as we do. And I pray that you'll see that this morning. So Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25 and on, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, and that's Jesus, to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and all of your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you'll live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, He passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And then the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. All right, now through the story, Jesus has taught us who our neighbor is. That our neighbor is anyone we meet with a need to meet along the road of life. And we've seen Jesus' unlimit love. And he's taught us that the essence of neighboring is showing loving kindness, independent of race, independent of sociopolitical status, independent of political party, independent of religion, all of those things, independent of all of those things. We are to show 
loving kindness. We are to administer mercy. And we're not talking just sympathy. We're not talking mere empathy. We're not even talking just compassion, that deep, we, we talked about that splankna, the, the you're deep in the guts suffering for somebody and having goodwill towards them so that they will no longer be suffering. It's more than just that compassion. It's that compassion moved into action and that's called mercy. That's God's hesed. It's his, it's his loving kindness and and. And that's where we get hung up. And so often we'll feel compassion. And then we'll feel like we've done it. We, we've, we've loved our neighbor. But we're not called to just compassion. We're called to action. Now, here what we see is this priest and this Levite, right? They, they walk along this road and they see this, this broken mess of humanity in, in the gutter. And they cross over to the other side and keep on going. They don't help. But then comes our unlikely hero, right? The Samaritan, an enemy. One called a half-breed or or a half-blood, a heretic. Somebody you don't touch. Somebody you just leave alone. But it says he had compassion. He felt the suffering of this man in his guts and wanted to do something. So he goes to him. A great risk to himself, right? Right? A great risk to himself. Because again, he's approaching the scene of a crime. So there he goes and approaches him. So he does not let fear hinder him from administering loving kindness, right? He doesn't let fear stop him. He also is not bullied by hurry. The Good Samaritan proves to be a good neighbor because he proves to be an interruptible neighbor. He is open to interruption. Now, we're not told a ton about the Good Samaritan. We do know he's traveling between Jerusalem and Jericho. We don't know which way he's going. Maybe he's traveling to Jerusalem because he's a merchant. Maybe he's traveling away because, you know, he's finally going to go down to Jericho and back up and around and to home because he hasn't seen his family, hasn't seen his kids in forever long. We don't know. Maybe, maybe he's on an urgent mission to visit a family member who's dying. We simply don't know these things. But what we do know is that he's human, right? He's human, Which means this, it means that there's some pressure of some kind that's pushing on him to be here or to be there, to do this or to do that. He lived in a bustling world, right? Here we are at the the center of of the, the Middle East there in Jerusalem, this energy city, the city where all the world comes and it's bustling, right? It's it's moving. And there he is, surrounded by all of this bustle, just like us, carried in the currents of the world. Yet, what does he do? He stops. Right? And he doesn't just stop for a moment, right? He stops and he bends down and he tends to wounds and he bandages this guy and then he puts him up on his donkey and then he takes him to an inn, however far away that was. It was going to be some kind of journey. And then he stays the night to care for this man. And then he says he's going to come back, right? And so we see him give of two very valuable resources, Something we wish we had more of. Time and energy. He's an interruptible neighbor. He was open to interruption in ordering to administer mercy. Are we? Are we? Because more often than not, we are we're caught in a grip of hurry, right? We, we're like the, the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. It's too late, late, late. I, I'm late for an important date because we are in the, the service of some cruel-hearted queen of hearts and we're rushing about doing this, doing that, running from here to there, run, run, run until we're run ragged and we're bone thin and exhausted, just trying to keep up with the mythical Joneses that are just somewhere out there, always out of our reach. And what hurry does is it makes us uninterruptible neighbors. Hurry hinders love. I mean, have you found yourself maybe at a crosswalk and then you're, you're walking somewhere and you're, you're holding your phone and you're, you're toggling back and forth between different text threads and emails coming in. Meanwhile, you're doing research for an upcoming project and you just can't wait for the light to go. So you just keep pounding the button at the crosswalk, even though it's a placebo, and you just keep nailing that thing, right? And then you realize your kids are asking you questions and this is like the 51st time they're asking you a question and you haven't even heard it because of all the stuff that you're focusing on and inside internally you're running at breakneck speed and this is your family day or, or maybe 
Or maybe five seconds just seems like an eternity for you. And when your internet won't load as, as quick as you want, you just freak out. Or, or it, this, this comes out, um, sometimes you're making lunch and you're, you're microwaving your lunch for a minute and you, you need to redeem that minute because you need to make the most of your time. So for that one minute that your, your food is cooking, you're pulling up an, an article on self-improvement to, to redeem your time, right? Or maybe it's driving on 580 behind the speed limit follower guy and you feel clinically insane because he's not going just a little bit over so you can get to where you need to go just a little bit faster. Or here, I do this one all the time. You're at Trader Joe's, right? And you get all your stuff and then you go and you look at the lines and then all of a sudden you move into analysis mode and you start like analyzing the contents of everyone's uh, cart, you know? And you're like, you're, you're doing ratios. You're like, there's a lot of stuff there um, it's, and it's small, it's gonna take forever. Their cart's full, but it's big stuff. You know? and, and you start like figuring out which line is going to be the quickest line to get through so you can get out of Trader Joe's two minutes earlier so you can go and get stopped by the red light down the street, Right? That is the jittery, soul-killing fever of hurry sickness. And what's troubling is it doesn't trouble us because it's become so normalized. It's just the way of life. It's the current that we live in. It's the pace that we go at. And we don't see how it's killing us. I've heard it said that impatience is the most widely accepted sin in Western culture. And we, we say the words, I'm busy, like they're a badge of honor, Right? Now, we, we've often said this quote here before. It's by uh, Peter Scazzaro, and he says this. He says, you can't live at warp speed without warping your soul. And that's so true. This is why we spent months last year going through a series called The Unhurried Life to know what it means to be an apprentice to Jesus, to get out of, of the, the currents and blurriness of this world and know him and know who we are and love neighbor well. And it's a hard thing to do, but it's so important. And so the, the correlate of the statement of uh, you can't live at warp speed without warping your soul, the correlate of that is this. You can't live at warp speed without warping your relationships with God and with neighbor. Intimacy can't be formed when, when you're running 90 miles an hour. Right? Depth can't happen when you're spreading yourself so thin. You, you, I mean, the, the breath is there, but it's, it's an inch. It's an inch deep and all of these relationships and people end up getting hurt because of it. We are so busy doing important stuff that, that it's not possible to administer mercy. Neighboring is, is ousted. Lover, loving our neighbors is blurred out of the picture of our life. And guys, that's a big problem. If Jesus boils all of this down to loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving our neighbor as ourselves, but we say, good advice, Jesus, but I'm busy, that's problematic. So there's another way to live. Jesus teaches us another way to live. What does it look like? Well, I want to share with you a story of another interruptible neighbor, and this neighbor is Jesus. So let's flip back a few chapters to Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 56. And in it, um, we get to see Jesus and we watch him be a wonderfully and, and merciful, interruptible neighbor. So let's learn something from Jesus here in this incredible story. It's a beautiful story. It's, it's powerful. Um, well, let's just, let's read it. And again, let's enter into this world here. Verse 40, Luke chapter 8, verse 40, the dying girl. Now, when Jesus returned... That's to an area where he was at, most likely his home base in uh, Capernaum in, in Galilee. The crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him because they knew he was a miracle worker and they knew he did some great things and they wanted to be around him, and so they were waiting for him. They were mobbing. And there came a man named Jairus, who was ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, she was dying. And Jesus went, the people pressed around him. Other translations say crushed, that he was being crushed by the people. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. The same amount of time that this little girl was alive. 
And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and she touched the fringe of his garment and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling, falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned and she got up at once and he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. How beautiful is this? This portrayal of parental love, the pathos of a father trying to care for his child and the mercy of God and the miraculous power of God all coming together, combining into this something wonderful. Now, we don't have the time this morning to work through this verse by verse, and that's not the aim. Um, But what I would like to do is move through this in in one big stroke to see how wonderfully interruptible Jesus is as a neighbor. But first, I mean, this is a little bit of a strange story, right? It's it's troubling at a few levels. It's a bit concerning. So, So Jesus is back where people know him, and the crowds are literally crushing just to get close to him, and then pressing through this crowd uh, in bold desperation and in passion comes a synagogue leader named Jairus. No sense of decorum or propriety, right? They're all abandoned right now because this is a dad who will do anything to see his daughter get up from her deathbed. So he's desperate, so he's clamoring. And by the way, he's a synagogue leader, which means he's someone of of high social status. He's well-known, he's well-to-do. And That kind of person doesn't run in this society. That kind of person doesn't do this, but he doesn't give a rip. He wants to see his daughter alive. So he runs to Jesus in these last hours and last breaths. He's in a hurry. And this is a holy hurry if we've ever seen one. A parent fighting for the life of their child. This man believed that Jesus could keep her alive. And this might be in Capernaum, we're not sure. And if so, we know that Jesus had healed in the synagogue there. So this man, this precedent, he, he trusts that Jesus can do something, that he can push back this fever or stop whatever is draining the life out of his precious baby girl. And so he asks Jesus, and then we get this telling line. It says, and he went with him. That has resonance beyond its surface level. And he went with him. Jesus goes with this man in his need. Jesus goes with the man in his pain. This is not just sympathy. This isn't just empathy. He goes with this man in compassion. Jesus cares. Jesus has compassion. His heart is brimming with mercy. This love that takes actions. And so the story just starts to to move forward here. And it ratchets up. The time is short. The urgency is thick. The clock is ticking. The anxiety and the fear of the fretting man. It is evident the disciples are speeding up, walking faster and faster because there's a sense of meaning and mission to what's going on. Jesus is on an urgent mission. Time is of the essence. The crowd is mobbing. Pulses are pounding. The atmosphere is bristling with life and death, bristling with the sense of drama and pathos. And then, and then, Jesus stops. Jesus just stops. 
And then Peter, well, Jesus says, who touched me? Who touched me? And Peter's like, Jesus, everyone is touching you. You're in a crowd. And the thought, the idea behind this is like, we don't have time for quizzical rabbi stuff. Don't Mr. Miyagi us at this point. Like, we, we, hurry. Time is of the essence. What are you doing? Come on. Everyone is touching you. And you can almost feel Jairus's response to this, right? His, his anxiety is at a fever pitch. His forehead sweating. His pulse is, is racing. His fear is swelling. Yet Jesus calmly insists that somebody touched him. Power went out from him. Someone was, someone was healed. And in this moment, the reality is Jesus knew what the disciples did not. Jesus knew what Jairus did not. He knew God's spirit, the Holy Spirit within him was moving. He knew that God was doing something wonderful. And I get it. Triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. It's confusing. I, I don't understand it. But we can revel in it. And the Holy Spirit moves. Jesus has been interrupted by a woman, yes. But Jesus has been interrupted by the movement of the Holy Spirit within him. See, here's what's going on. We have a woman suffering. Now, she had been in torment, a many-sided hell, physical and emotional and social for how many years? 12 years, an issue of bleeding, right? A flow of blood for over a, de a decade. We don't know if it was a uterine rupture or, or what, but can you imagine, like, women, can you imagine how this would have altered her life, right? The pain, the shame, the complications, the limitations, the heartache. And it says she had gone broke trying to find a cure. She suffered exploitation at the hands of many doctors and people who said they, they were doctors. She had been an outcast, knowing the pain of alienation, right? She was not allowed to touch anyone and no one was allowed to touch her because she was unclean and she would render other people unclean, which means she was not a church. She was not to the temple in, in worship. In effect, she was the walking dead hopeless and hurting. But then she risks to touch Jesus because she trusts that he can do something. And she does. She touches him and then vitality rushes into her world. Jesus, and by the way, Jesus could have kept walking. It's a win-win. She touches Jesus. She's healed. She's not called out. Doesn't have to experience the shame. And Jesus goes on to care for the, the serious situation that's at hand. But that's not what happens. Jesus stops Someone touched me, right? Okay. Why, why does he stop? Why does he not allow her to remain anonymous? Because he has compassionate guts for her too. He knows she doesn't just need a physical healing. She needs a whole soul healing. She needs physical healing. She needs to be brought back into community, brought back into society. And he says one of the most sweetest words that you can to her. He calls her daughter. Can you imagine what that would have done to her? 12 years, untouched, uncared for, an outcast, feeling unloved, and here the one you think might judge you turns to you and says, daughter? And suddenly you feel the embrace of God as father? How that must have healed her. Daughter. So you guys, neighboring means being interruptible because being a neighbor doesn't just mean lobbing money at something or throwing a meal over a fence to somebody. It means engaging in a relationship and that requires time. Time invested and schedules interrupted. Now this, this interruption will not ruin Jesus' plans to help those he wants to help. In fact, it'll be a multiplier of blessing. How's that? Well, let's see. 
So as the story moves on here, we see that this is, this is the place of terrible tension, right? Place yourself in Jairus' shoes. He's dying on the inside right now because he knows his little girl is dying. Jesus has pushed pause and he's, self, he's helping somebody with a chronic condition. What's he to do? Say, Jesus, wake up, move on. Don't you get it? And then a messenger comes and the surreal Terrible words that a parent never wants to hear are spoken. Your child is dead. Stop bugging the teacher. It's over. Now at this minute, like, we should be uncomfortable with this story, don't you think? Doesn't it feel a bit uncomfortable? Because if we're thinking through this, here someone might accuse Jesus, the master surgeon, of malpractice. Think about it, right? Jesus has treated the chronic disease before the acute emergency issue. Imagine a doctor stopping treatment on someone going into cardiac arrest to go sit with somebody who's suffering from Crohn's disease. It doesn't make sense, right? Malpractice. The girl's dead. Jesus hasn't been fast enough. He didn't he didn't hurry. The messenger says, Don't bother. But how does Jesus respond? Well, in verse 50, we get these incredible words. He says, do not fear. Only believe and she will be well. And then when he gets to the house and everyone's crying, he says, do not weep for she is not dead but sleeping. Now, Jesus knows she's dead. He's not dumb. Jesus is reframing death in light of who he is and what he's about to do. Because what he does is he goes into this house and this girl who has died, he goes to her like a father goes to a child early in the morning and says, sweetheart, get up, holds their hand, gets them out of bed and says, it's time for breakfast. That's how Jesus overcomes death. How strong of a God is this? And so he says, little one, get up. It's a sweet affectionate term. And then he says, get her some food, right? It's breakfast time. It's probably life cereal, because that seems to make sense, given the situation. I know, it's so bad. Just ruined the whole flow. It's so bad. But, I mean, Silas woke up this morning, and I, I wake him up, and, and then first thing he says is breakfast, you know? That's what's going on here. Jesus says, get her, get her some food. Now, I want to ask you this. Was Jesus on an important mission? Absolutely undeniably to save the life of a child undeniably important a situation arises the holy spirit moves jesus engages but do you know how often we don't let ourselves be interrupted our schedules our agendas or whatever be interrupted because we have important things to do i get it i have to make a living i have a family to take care of i have a goal to meet I need to keep up my my grades. I I need to graduate. I don't want to let so-and-so down. They're counting on me. I can't miss miss their ballgame, whatever it is. There's always something that we deem as an important mission. That's why we do the things that we're doing is we believe they're important. Yes, it's all true, right? These things are, are important. And I'm not advocating irresponsibility, okay? I'm advocating spirit-led interruptibility. Very different. Spirit-led interruptibility. I'm not advocating chronic tardiness, which many of us are chronically tardy and we don't even realize that we're late to that party because we're late to everything. But time sensitivity to know what God is doing that we ourselves did not plan. Jesus wasn't in a hurry. He wasn't frantic because he knew that the Holy Spirit led for the glory of God, for the good of of others, and showed how great the Father was. He knew that as the Spirit leads, he leads into love and wonderful things. And he leads into something wonderful. We have a poverty-stricken, outcast woman healed, reinitiated into society. She exemplifies faith, is an example put forward of God's fatherly love towards her, which Jairus needed to hear as a father whose daughter was facing imminent death to stoke the fires of Jairus' faith. And then we see Jesus pick this little girl up out of death like it's just a nighttime sleep. Jesus, trusting the Father, 
being led by the Spirit has turned an interruption into a demonstration of mercy and love for the good of those who trust him, providing an explosion of the glory of God for the watching world. He would not be hurried. He knows how hurry short circuits love. By the way, let me note a difference here between having much to do and hurry. It's okay that we are busy, and when you think, when you think of that, you know, there's a lot to do. So that a lot to do is the external stuff. There's all this stuff to do. That's different than hurry. Hurry is that inward condition of the heart that is frantic, that's frenetic, that's, that's rushing. It's a heart ill at ease, just living in the turmoil of haste. Jesus had plenty to do, right? He had, a, he had a lot to do. But he didn't live in that state of haste. Hurry blurs what's important. And we live in the Bay Area, and it is a blurry area, isn't it? Everything is running at break next speed. And are we willing to be interrupted for the good of others that makes known the glory of God? Are we willing to lay aside our agendas so that God can break into the plans of our day because he just might know something about someone in need or something he wants us to do that we haven't planned for. So how do we be interruptible? How do we be interruptible? First thing, um, let's talk about a few of these. Uh, let's, let's plan for being interruptible. Let's be wise. Let's build some breathing room. Let's build some buffer into our schedule as we look at our weeks. It's, it's a silly thing to, to fill a glass up all the way to the brim and try to walk across the room without spilling it. You're going to spill some. There's no margin. Why do you drive so many feet behind the car in front of you? In case they slam on their brakes, you have room. You have margin to stop. But so we, we get that when it comes to cars, but we don't get that when it comes to time and schedules and meetings. We, we do our meetings and everything back to back to back, so we end up running into the thing in front of us. So what if we build some white space breathing room into our weeks? Because you know things are going to go different than you imagine. And then what if you have an engagement with a neighbor and, and everything is back to back and there's no margin? Well, then I can't do it. But what if there's some breathing room and say, you know what? We allotted some margin and some white space in the, in the week. We'll, we'll shift some things around and we'll be there for so-and-so. Be wise with your time, right? Next one, submit your daily agenda to God's direction. This is, this is a, a perspective thing. What if in, in the morning, in your routine, when you, you begin to pray, you say, God, I have an agenda. I thank you for the things that you have on the schedule that I don't know. Help me to submit my agenda to yours. Lead me today and help me to hold some of this with a loose grip. It'll change how you interact. That's part of that unceasing prayer. Father, my, I submit my agenda to yours. Yours is greater. Lead me. Fact check your time analysis. Um, I hear it all the time. People say, well, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. I find that very curious, especially when you look at some of the reports and that the average American will watch five hours of TV a day. And then you add on top of that, with, within the demographic of, of millennials, that there's five hours of social media on top of that. That's a lot of time. And I fear we say, I don't have time, but we haven't really assessed our, our time. We just say it. It's not so much that we don't have time, it's just that we use it poorly. So fact check your time analysis. Trust that God can redeem lost time. And when I say lost, I don't really mean lost. It's not lost. You never, it's never lost time to love someone. It's never lost time to follow the leading of the Spirit, to do something that you didn't plan, that God has written into your story and written into the story of somebody else. It's never lost time. And what's curious is that you'll find when you trust God and when you, when you follow him with those things, he somehow ends up making a way for you to do a lot of the stuff that you needed to get done. And you're like, where did the time come from? It's incredible how he blesses you with redeemed and multiplied time. I'm not saying your weeks aren't hard or challenging, but it's amazing what he will do to redeem, quote unquote, the lost time. Okay, so this is that one. Look for loving interruptions. Look for these things. Keep your eyes 
open for them. And here's what happens often is when we're interrupted and our schedule um, is, is now pushed on by something, what's the feeling we generally get? Yeah, thank you. That's the sound. It's, it's irritation. It's frustration. So here's what I would submit to you is, is be easily triggered. Like when you feel that frustration, let that trigger you to go, okay, I'm feeling this because my, my agenda is being pushed. I'm being interrupted. What are you doing here? Where is the opportunity to love and, and to provide mercy or care for somebody in this interruption? So when you're feeling that irritation, let that be a trigger for knowing that this is an interruptible moment and that God is doing something. So look for those. This next one sounds kind of simple, but it's powerful. Take walks around your neighborhood. It doesn't matter where you live. Around your, your apartment complex, around your neighborhood, in the park, where, wherever. What this does is this opens up opportunities for, for um, neighboring, for gospel collisions that you never could have orchestrated. You're making yourself available. You're seeing what's going on in the place that you live. Take a five-minute walk. It doesn't have to be, you know, a two-hour hike. Just take a five-minute walk. Pray that God would lead you to meet people. Pray that God would use even those five minutes of eyes open, ears open, walking around the neighborhood. That somebody might be loved well. This last one sounds kind of bizarre. Be willing to interrupt your neighbor. Um, I thought we were talking about ourselves being interrupted. Well, um, when you practice interrupting other people for the sake of love, then it helps us to take interruptions better and listen to what God is doing. And so when we have eyes to see other people and say, I think I'm going to interrupt and, and, and engage them, incredible things could happen. But, but we don't do that because we, we map onto other people our own issues and we go, look, they're, they're working in their garage. They don't want to be interrupted. They just got home from work. They're just, they want to hurry up and get into the house. They can't pull into their garage and close it like they, they wish they could because there's too much stuff. We don't have basements in California, so it's all in the garage. Right, so they're walking in and you're like, I'm not gonna interrupt them because they don't wanna be interrupted. Don't put your baggage on them. <laughs> Maybe you need to engage them. Practice interrupting other people that you might learn how to be interrupted. All right, um, there's, there's a way you can sum all those things up and it's simply this, it's, it's we are called to crucify haste by trusting in this God of time and resources and relationships, by loving God with your trust, loving him with your obedience, giving your time and everything that you are for his glory and the good of others. Because hurry is an enemy of loving our neighbor. And we are called to love our neighbor. And if we say, sorry, Jesus, I'm too busy for the important thing, but I love you, we have something that we gotta work through, don't we? So years ago, um, in Tacoma, there was a, a headline that ran like this. In big, bold letters. The headline said, Unplanned Ride. And then the fo following words. Tattoo, the basset hound, never intended to go for an evening run. But he had no choice when his owners shut his leash in the car door and took off for a drive with Tattoo still outside the vehicle. I know, stick with me, hold on a minute. <laughs> this could go very badly. <laughs> Motorcycle officer Terrence Filbert was patrolling around 7.25 p.m. Wednesday evening when he noted a vehicle that appeared to have something dragging from behind it. As Filbert passed the vehicle, he noticed that the dragging item was a basset hound on a leash. Filbert gave chase and finally stopped the car on North 21st Street but not before the dog and his racing paws had reached a speed of 25 miles per hour. The car's occupants, a man and a woman, jumped out when Filbert told them they were dragging a dog, and the distressed couple jumped out and began calling, Tattoo! Tattoo! The eight-month-old dog was not injured, but Officer Filbert suggested that they take the dog to a nearby animal clinic to be checked out. No citation was issued, but poor Tattoo was in need of a long rest. <laughs> A rough day for tattoo, right? Basset hound, 25 miles an hour. Come on, put that in your head. That's nuts. And it's funny until we realize tattoo's terrible day is our normal life. Friends, we are leashed to the currents 
of this culture and our own broken desires and impulses that have us running so everything is a blur that we don't have time to spend with God and I don't have time to know my neighbor. I don't have time to know their name. And we are being dragged along by the currents of this world and its brokenness. And we are running towards our death. Meanwhile, we're not seeing the people in need around us. We're like Tattoo. Jesus was not leashed to the expectations and unhealthy ambitions of this world like, like we are. He does, he's not on the treadmill exhausting himself to, keep, to keeping up with the Joneses. He, at the right time, led by the Spirit, by the way, the very same Spirit that lives within us, he went to the cross in obedience to the Father to die for our sins, to bring clarity to our blurry world, to slow us down. His grace interrupted our broken lives. And if it weren't for his grace, where would you be? His grace interrupted us when we didn't want to be interrupted. And his death and his resurrection has shattered the hold that this ill-formed haste has over us as we try to prove ourselves or save ourselves or look like gods in front of everyone else. He shattered that by his death, the resurrection, and by giving us his spirit, making us partakers of the divine nature, we share in the same spirit that we can trust this guy with our time. And we can follow his leading. Jesus never abandoned his important mission to see life brought to the dead. And that's what he did to us, right? He brought life to the dead. He hasn't abandoned it. He, won't, he will keep doing it. Yet he was wonderfully interruptible, administering mercy by the power of the Spirit. May we walk as he did. Haste is the breakneck pace of the kingdom of men. A walking pace is the healing way of the kingdom of God. Heavenly Father, you are an incredible you are a good dad who sees our acute emergency needs and knows our chronic issues and in kindness and compassion, you engage with both. Jesus, you bind us, you wrap our wounds, you were wounded for us. Holy Spirit, you are here comforting, counseling, caring, calling us to attention to our glorious Father, our Savior, and to the needs of our neighbors. Would you be honored this morning? Would we be warmed to the wonderful, beautiful truth of all of this? It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen.